everyone. My name is Monica Granados, and with my colleague, Brigitte Gazinha, we work on the open climate and open culture programs at Creative Commons. And I'm here to tell you a little story about why tackling climate change needs both open science and open culture. So I'm an improviser by training. So um, something that I picked up while I was in graduate school and in improv, you start on an empty stage like this. That's the cartoon me on stage a and it's completely empty. But from this empty environment, we can weave hour long stories from a single suggestion. So, you know, we can call out into the audience and they will yell out, there are eight shoes on the floor or your scene partner will come in on this empty stage and say there are eight shoes on the floor. And then all of a sudden with our imagination, we materialize that there are eight shoes on the floor. And the job of the improviser is then to contextualize why there are eight shoes on the floor. And we could come up with stories like maybe, you know, um, insect with uh, four pairs of legs came in and dropped all their shoes, or maybe there was an explosion at the shoe factory. But in that contextualization, it gives us a lot of meaning and insight and information about our world. It helps this world that we're making up make sense. So I wanna take you to this idea of context and how important context is in many situations. And certainly when we want to understand climate change, how important context is. So let's go to that stage. Climate change is affecting every aspect and every corner of the world. We're seeing global temperature increases, sea level rise, shifts in animal and plant ranges. So that means that animals that were in one latitude or one part of the world are moving in line with the temperature Recording changes that the world is experiencing. We're also seeing a loss of sea ice and melting glaciers. And so these are some of this, the really big impacts global scale changes that we're seeing in relation and as a result of climate change. But these are all really just facts when I talk about them this way. They're just numbers and recordings of the amount of sea level or the latitude and longitude of a given species and how that changes over time. We need the human context to really make sense of how all of those changes to the planet are affecting humans. And I'm arguing here that culture is that human context. It helps us understand what these facts mean. By understanding and bringing culture into this dialogue, we understand not only about the intrinsic value of these species, something that many humans have seen since the existence of our species, but it was eloquently put by Charles Darwin when he talked about these endless forms most beautiful. We are losing that intrinsic value of species but also really what that means to humans from a species perspective. You know, there are culturally important species where those range changes and loss of habitat are affecting populations that humans rely on, both from a culturally important perspective, but also from a livelihood perspective. Rising global temperatures are also affecting the future and the you know, the uh, younger generations and the way that they see themselves in this world and their place in this world. We're also seeing that 
rising sea levels, for example, are threatening homes and livelihoods, that there are going to be places where humans that are currently living in cities that are going to be inhabitable due to climate change. So that culture and understanding the culture gives us that human context, gives that context to the facts, the knowledge that we collect around climate change. So how do we access knowledge and culture from you know, a very high level? I'll start talking about knowledge. I think it's probably no surprise to most of the audience here that the open sharing of research outputs, the way that we get a lot of the knowledge of how we understand the world, particularly from a natural science perspective, is not the default. Just two percentages here that I want to highlight um, as someone who is uh, situated in Canada, only about 38% of publications with a Canadian author are open access. This is coming from data from the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. Only about 41% of the papers within a, uh, an author from the United States are open access. But something really interesting happened in 2020, of course, with the incidents of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was this realization that something was different about the crisis we were going through and the underpinning and the importance of science to helping us understand the crisis that we were going through. And just as it affected many of our lives, it also affected the way that researchers responded. This is just a snapshot from 2021, where we see that about 77% of COVID-19 papers are open access. That's a stark contrast to the previous numbers that I quoted. And those numbers are actually increasing um, as we look at snapshots closer to present day 2023. We also saw an adoption of um, Preprints, so versions of manuscripts before they had gone through the peer review process were uploaded in record numbers. About 80,000 preprints were uploaded to preprint servers from December 31st uh, or up to December 31st. So again, looking at a snapshot, that's an incredible increase in the uptake of preprints, particularly by the COVID-19 community. And I think there really is then a lot of evidence to show that when we recognize that there is a crisis, that we need knowledge in order to help us understand the problem and solve the problem, that the research community responds and there is a strong recognition of this. But what about climate change? What about the issue that we were just talking about, this issue that is affecting every corner of the planet. We looked at climate change outputs, again, through our work with the Current Open Knowledge Initiative, and found that about only 47% of the outputs between 1980 and 2022 are open. And arguably, climate change is and is going to have a much larger impact on the world. We are in a climate crisis and we need to see the same response that we saw for COVID-19 as we do then for, as we should see for climate change. So how can we elicit that same response? Well, I'm here to tell you also a little bit about the Open Climate Campaign and what we are arguing is this, you know, this narrative that if we're, if we are going to understand a problem like climate change, if we are going to solve climate change or generate mitigations and solutions, the knowledge needs to be open that that is a fundamental um, a precondition to us generating those solutions. So the Open Climate Campaign is this four-year project that started in August of 2022, where we're working to make the open sharing of research outputs the norm in climate science. 
that really fall under four broad categories. We've got 11 different goals really around advocacy, so sharing information, reaching out to researchers and telling them, you are working on the world's greatest problem. You need to make your work open and here are a lot of tools that are made available through the community, through many of the people that are probably sitting, listening uh, and participating at Wikimania. We wanna work hand in hand with funders of research because we understand that if we change the rules around funding, if we change open access policies, that researchers will respond and will catalyze changes in behavior and adoption of open practices. We also want to make sure that this is an international campaign. Much of the work that has happened around open access has really had a global north focus and as a result has often marginalized many voices in the open access communities that don't come from the global north. So we're working to implement open access and international frameworks, but also to make sure that we that we uh, center voices from traditionally excluded geographical regions in this space. And finally, we want to